Welcome back, AP. <clears throat> I know it's been a little while, but we got to get some stuff done. Um, so we're still set on pace right now. We've got one more thematic chapter to cover. We got to talk about imperialism. We're going to take like a condensed uh, test on nationalism and imperialism. Uh, something a little bit shorter, possibly just multiple choice. Um, simply because we need to keep moving. Um, and then we're going to move on to World War One, which is one of my favorite things to study. I secretly like the war itself more than I like uh, World War Two and the fashion of which it was fought. Um, excuse me. Uh, and then we're going to keep moving forward and talk about some other stuff and just a bunch of other little things in general. Um, and then we'll end up right now finishing right where we need to, uh, which is pretty huge. Uh, usually when you do this your first time, you don't actually get there. So we talked about all this stuff, modernization of Russia, um, very, very humiliating defeat in the Crimean War, terrible infrastructure, uh, happy communal owning of land, right? Um, the earliest reforms and they freed the serfs and then collectivized agriculture and the Zemstevo, like actually never was as good as they wanted it to be. Uh, Russian Jews were a little bit more liberalized, government subsidized, railroads, etc., etc., etc. So, now we talked about last how Russian industrialization came in two huge bursts, right? So, remember it went... Alexander II, the czar that was progressive and reform-based, right? He's the one that freed the serfs, uh, created the Zemstevo, created a collectivized agriculture between the serfs, gave them the land, about half of that anyway, um, created a better um, infrastructure, subsidized companies so they would actually create some stuff. And then Alexander III is going to come along. He's very responsatory, so he doesn't really do anything. And then the second great boom comes from 1890 to 1900. We talked about this in class, so if you just want to keep going, that's fine. But pushed by a key leader, which is Sergei Vite, and because in Russian they don't have W sounds, they only say V's, and it's actually really, really cool. There's a movie Star Trek, and the very first Star Trek movie, um, uh, Chekhov is the he's one of the helmsmen of the bridge, and every time he has to say uh, Victor, they come out sounding like W's, and every time he has to say something with a W, it comes out sounding like a V, and it's a really, really funny thing. But his big belief that he progressed and put out there, much like Count Cavour and Garibaldi and all those guys, has to do with the fact that Russia was industrial of backwards, right? And if they're industrially backwards, then they're actually not going to progress and be on the right amount of power as the rest of Western Europe. He's also a big fan of this style from the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s that I'm really, really big fan of, which is the detachable collars and uh, things like that on the shirt. Sorry, just really like the suit that he's wearing. Um... Really like everything he's got going on. If I grow a beard like that, I would. Now, anyway, he doubled the network of, uh, he implemented reforms to double the network of railways and made them state-owned, right? Which is actually kind of slightly socialist in a way, right? Taking state ownership of large industries. But the main reason behind that is because a government, so some of these railway companies were being proposed to by the government, hey, we'll subsidize your railway if you build a railroad through like Siberia, and a lot of these companies are like, why the hell would I build a railroad through that frozen Arctic tundra where no one, li where there are more yaks than people, right? There are more reindeer out there than people. And so Sergei decides, like, all right, if we're going to be able to create our like new Silk Road from China to Russia to create our own base of raw materials and get this factory idea going. We got to build some of our own railroads, so that's why he pushed for the state-owned railroads. He also endorses big, really high tariffs to make Russian goods cheaper than foreign goods. He also creates a gold standard um, to prevent inflation in the economy, which he believed was the right way of doing things. Now, he also was the creator of the outsourcing model in Russia, which paid foreign companies to put up factories in Russia to employ and create new networks of funds, right? So he would pay French companies to come in and build French factories, and they would actually receive a high markup on their value of their product. However, the labor costs they would pay infinitely less for, right? So Russia is still mostly peasants though, but they were catching up or starting to anyway. Now, here we go. So then everything's going to blow up in everybody's face in the Russian Revolution in 1905, right? Now tensions are going to begin to build because following Alexander III, the next Romanov comes into power, the Tsar Nicholas II, right? The last Tsar of Russia. Nicholas is an absolute idiot. He's an absolute monarch, but he's also an absolute idiot, right? Like, he 
is not a good ruler. He's very authoritarian. He kind of harkens back to the Bismarckian idea of an authoritarian monarchy, but he doesn't understand that Bismarck knew that you had to relinquish a little bit of power to get the reforms and the ideas across that you wanted. Nicholas, on the other hand, doesn't even want to do that, right? He doesn't want to do that unless he absolutely has to. So, and a lot of this, though, is going to begin to build. A lot of tension is going to begin to build under Nicholas II. The economy's going down a little bit. Uh, Russia's still mostly peasantry. 90% of them are peasants. Uh, a lot of them are getting really upset. The troops are very, very, like, just not, like, very happy right now. Uh, and a lot of this is due to the fact that imperialism all throughout Europe was peaking around 1903. Now, Russia at the time wasn't really involved in this imperialism game, right? A lot of that has to do with their landlocked status, their inability to have a very, very fully functioning naval unit that doesn't re leave out of anywhere other than the Baltic Sea. So a big part of this was that Russia was like, all right, I got an idea. We're going to imperialize Chinese Manchuria, right? Now, Manchuria is in northern China, closer to where modern-day Korea and northern China are today, right towards Mongolia, all right? Now, they wanted to create, number one, a new pipeline of goods and raw materials, and second, write this down, an aggressive new area naval bases, right? They wanted to create new naval bases, and they wanted to do this so they could try and imperialize some of these other areas, like Guam, uh, areas that the French had already imperialized a long time ago, like the Vietnamese, uh, like which was French Indochina, uh, places in China, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, like they wanted to go that route, right? Because Africa was pretty much all taken up by this point. When we get into the next chapter, when we talk about the Berlin Conference and the partitioning of Africa, it's pretty much sucked up by everybody and their brother already. Now, Russia's going to begin imperializing Chinese Manchuria. However, the Japanese have something to say about that. The Japanese have wanted Manchuria since Manchuria was a thing, all right? Now, a lot of this has to do with the fact that if you look at a map of China, Japan is geographically located more northern China, right? Uh, and the Chinese Manchurian area has a large population, large workforce, a lot of resources. Uh, the climate is very decent when it comes to Chinese, like, growing for agriculture. A lot of different opportunities in Manchuria, right? The Japanese want it as well. So, to try and instill some national pride, Nicholas believes we're going to roll in and we're going to create a war against the Japanese. And half of those guys are still samurai, for crying out loud. They got swords and armor still. The other half of them had been recently industrialized right after the American Civil War in like the 1870s when they actually fought a war against their own samurai to try and create a new modern Japanese state, right? But this war is going to fail, and it is going to be embarrassing, right? They suffer another humiliating defeat at the hands of the barely industrialized Japanese. They had only been industrialized for maybe 20 years, and on the grand scale of things, that's literally almost nothing. They're still like Shinto religion, where they believe their emperor is a god. They are like still using... Uh, well, they had actually acquired bolt-action rifles by this point. But they're just, they're not as up to par as the Russians were, and they just smacked them. Like, they just royally wailed on them. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that the Russians couldn't use their naval fleet because the Japanese didn't really have an established naval fleet, so they had to go into landlocked battles, and the Japanese overtook them. All right? So, a lot of really, really cool stuff, though, but I can't dwell on that for too long. So, all of these things are going to start spiraling out of control. Demands for reform. Extremely low economy. The failure of these wars. Troop, like, everyone's just upset, right? Uh, terrible working conditions in places like Moscow. So Russian workers are going to mobilize an illegal labor party. Political parties are illegal at this point in Russia, right? Illegal. No political parties or labor parties allowed. And they were vying for a liberal democratic government, which means they want two things. What does every liberal democrat want during this day and age of European history? A constitution? and a parliament. That's what everyone of them wants. A constitution and a parliament. Preferably a legislative branch parliament that has more power than the monarchy itself, right? So, while the army was occupied over in Japan, because this went from 1904 to 1906, wait, no, 1905 to 1906? 1904 to 1905. So, while they're occupied over in Japan, while everybody realizes that we're going to lose this war against the Japanese, we've heard what's going on, right? Bloody Sunday occurs. One of the most monumental, craziest things that's ever occurred in Russian history. It's in St. Petersburg, right? So in January 1905, in the cold, in the snow, in the 
heapingly terrible conditions of the factories, a massive crowd of workers arises in St. Petersburg in front of the Winter Palace just to present a petition, just to present a piece of paper that was written, like signed by all these workers saying that liberal reforms need to come and that the monarchy needs to relinquish some of its power. And what do you think happened? It's called Bloody Sunday for a reason. You guessed it, hundreds were killed and wounded. Nicholas ordered the military to fire on the crowd. They did so. Hundreds of them were killed and wounded in the tr attempt to disperse the crowd. The major effect of this is going to be the extreme contempt for the Tsar and the monarchy by the working class. Put a comma right there. Also the military, right? Because now remember, just because you were a part of a professional army didn't necessarily mean you weren't a part of the peasantry or lower class, right? So this is going to trigger multiple uprisings by workers, troop mutinies from the military. Then success is going to come around, sort of when they organize a giant strike in October, right? So it was called, like, so there was a general strike. All of these different industries workers decided to go on strike and to try and cripple the Russian economy. And so it's actually going to be somewhat effective. And Nicholas was forced to get the economy rolling again, forced to establish a new constitution. Now, the Russians were idiots in this one thing, though. Now, remember, every time we talked about progressive reform in Europe, when we talked about Metternich, fall of the Napoleonic Empire, when we talked about moving forward from the Napoleonic Empire going into all this new stuff, uh, the problem has always been the stratification of the social classes, right? The aristocracy wants to stay conservative. The middle class wants to become liberal. The poor want to be socialists, right? Well, the aristocracy has the power at the time, so that means that the reforming classes, the middle and the poor, they have different motives, right? They have different motives of extreme versus that ah, just want stuff for me, right? So this is going to be kind of successful after this general strike, because the Tsar is going to issue this thing called the October Manifesto. The October Manifesto promises the following things. Full civil rights. They're going to appoint the Duma. And the Duma is the new legislative body. They're also going to, ex or a parliament. You can just write a parliament underneath that if you want to. Um, also, they're going to issue a new constitution. Now, when they were talking about doing this constitution, they hadn't issued it yet. So dumb. Why would you agree to this without a document, right? No one had actually talked about the fact that the D election of the Duma split the excuse me split the opposition. The middle class suppressed the lower class rebellions, feeling that they had won. So they were like, "All right, lower class, calm down. We we got what we wanted." Nah, but the middle class had just gotten what they wanted. The monarchy stayed alive with a new constitutional monarchy on the eve of the very first Duma, right? Because here's the thing: all these legislative bodies in Europe had to be called into session by the monarchy. They still do this in England. They still do this in France, or er, not as much in France anymore. They still do this in a lot of other European countries. The monarchy calls into the parliamentary sessions, right? So. <clears throat> on the eve of the very, very first one being called into session, Nicholas is going to issue the fundamental laws or the new constitution. Now, the thing about it is it's going to be peppered in there with a lot of really messed up stuff. The Duma was going to be elected by universal suffrage. Check, the middle class got what they wanted. Check, the poor got what they wanted. They were made to create and debate laws. Check, they got what they wanted. Yes, we're going to be able to move some things along and the monarchy is going to be limited in power. However, the Tsar still retained an absolute veto. So no matter what came through there, he was allowed to just shut it down. Okay, so not a very progressive revolution in 1905 if you really, really look at it. Now, continuing forward though, when the middle class actually bucked back and was like, you can't do this. This is not what we wanted. This is not what we asked for. You need to relinquish some of your power. He is just going to dismiss the Duma. He's going to be like, all right, go home. Fine. I'm going to rewrite the electoral process so that the majority of the seats in the Duma are controlled by the aristocracy, the people that support me. All right? He's going to abolish community-owned property, the one thing that kept Russians happy, right? So, And then he's going to push the Western factory model onto them. So communally-based property was no longer a thing. B massive urbanization movements are going to happen, and all these poor are going to begin to move into the city centers and start joining up with these factories. Unrest had never 
been higher, okay? So in 1905, there was a failed revolution. It was a failure. A lot of people say, well, it was so more progressive. The Duma was just as bad as the monarchy, all right? It was just a new face for it. It was one more layer. A lot of revisionist historians believe that the Duma, the election of the Duma, and then the creation of the con of the very, very, like, arist ar aristocratic Duma has to do a lot with the, the barrier between the public and the goings-on of the government in Russia. To this day, the government believes that it still should be able to operate with some type of autonomy behind like a curtain of sorts. It wasn't until Gorbachev in the 1980s when he actually came up with Glasnost and Perestroika to be able to try and actually decrease some of that anonymity and the Russians like, like basically blacklisted him for it and he's going to be bucked out and the entire USSR is going to fall, right? So... This, all this, this slide, phenomenally important. So important. Put a star on it. It's extremely important. I guarantee you they will ask about this stuff. The 1905 revolution period, that's, that's bedrock European, AP European test question stuff, okay? Don't forget that. Now, we're going to handle this in like three slides. Uh, this is like basic stuff, the decline of the Ottomans, right? It's not that important. It's very, very self-explanatory, right? Because here's the thing. Let's keep this brief. The Ottoman Empire is falling, all right? And it's kind of a lot like a, trying to think here. It's kind of a lot like a piece of rotten fruit in your fridge, right? Uh, particularly things like cucumbers, stuff like that. They may look fine on the outside, but on the inside they're rotten. Uh, they're losing some texture on the outside. Little parts are starting to like decrease, it's like a real bruised up, messed up apple, right? So... The thing about it is the Ottoman was at the height of its power under Suleiman, right? Suleiman the Magnificent. You remember him. He's the guy with the onion hat, right? If you don't remember, Google really quick. Suleiman the Magnificent and the onion hat will pop right up, all right? The West is beginning to industrialize under this, like, when Suleiman was in power. Slowly, now keep in mind, slowly. Like, the steam engine hadn't been invented yet. Nothing really industrial had been invented yet, but the enclosure system is on the way, the consumer revolution, uh, the putting out system, you know what I mean? They're starting to move forward. Um, conservative Ottoman, though, is going to fall behind rapidly. Now, the theme of the Ottoman Empire has always been Muslim conservatism, right? Don't relinquish our religious values. Uh, always stay conservative. Keep the public at a distance. Um, our great economy will keep them happy, right? So nationalism, however, is going to begin to destroy this empire in particular, right? The Austro-Hungarian Empire is going to begin to fall a little bit as well, but not nearly as bad as this one. So in 1816, Serbia is going to be granted autonomy because Napoleon takes it over, right? And at the Congress of Vienna, when he leaves, they just give it up. And they're like, all right, fine, we'll let you have that, okay? In 1830, Greece is going to nationalize, right? Bang, lost another part. In 1830, for all the way up to 1847, French, the French are going to take over Algeria and Northern Africa, which is controlled by the Ottomans at the time under Charles X. Like, they're just losing territory on the outside. That's the rotten, the apple on the outside. It's got those bruises and nasty looks on the outside, right? But on the inside, it was even worse, right? Because the struggle within the empire was awful. An Egyptian governor at the time, so really quick, stop, stop writing. Underneath struggle in the empire, put, um, rule, like, but extreme conservatism, like extreme Muslim conservatism, versus uh, liberal like versus I'm not I'm not trying to say like liberal because that's not what the case is, but it's more like less conservative Muslim administrations, right? So the hardcore conservatives, like this guy out of Egypt, he's a governor and he's called Muhammad Ali. Uh-huh. All right. So, but he's a big time Muslim and he believes in the old ways of the Ottoman and he's the governor of Egypt, right? So he's actually going to use French trained forces, thanks to Napoleon, because Napoleon actually invaded that area and tried to set up like another French colony there. But when it failed, there was some still French remnants left behind in a military base. So these French, uh, so these Egyptian soldiers were French trained. Uh, He's going to send, Muhammad Ali is going to send them out to occupy, sorry, I'm just imagining Muhammad Ali with boxing gloves, like sending Egyptian soldiers out. So to occupy several areas, um, including the outskirts of Serbia, including Syria, including different areas in the Middle East, um, and try to overthrow the sultan of the Ottoman at the time, Muhammad II, right? Or it's not in the Muhammad, Mahmud, Mahmud II, right? The great European power that's going to save the sultan by forcing the Ali to stop is going to be the British, the French, the Austrians, 
and the now growing German population, right? So a lot of this is like, but why? But why would they force Ali to stop doing this, right? Why would Ali, why would you intervene in a country's goings on to stop them from trying to be more stable as a government? Well, the European powers paid him off and told him that we will attack you in support of the Sultan if you continue this, all right? So he was forced to retreat. But mainly because the European powers loved a weak Ottoman. Why did I put Anne? That's stupid. All right, anyway, why did, like, they loved a weak Ottoman. If the Ottoman is weak, then they can make money off of them easier, right? If the Ottoman is strong, then they can start throwing tariffs up, and then they can start trying to increase their draw, and then they can start trying to take over other places. The great European powers of France, England, uh, Germany, Austria, Russia, they like a weak Ottoman because it's easier to profit off of them, right? So then the Ottomans realized to stay on par with the other Europeans, we need to increase some reforms, right? Let's bring on this thing called the Tanzimat, right? The Tanzimat was a series of radical reforms by the Ottoman government between 1839 and 1876. Now, this is all going to culminate in the creation of like a European model constitution and a parliament, but it's going to fail because it's just way too conservative, or excuse me, way too liberal for this extremely conservative empire, right? So the Tanzimat, failure, right? Now, that's going to increase their decline because when they began to fail under the conservative sultan because it was causing too much dissension, right? The Tanzimat is going to fail and because the Muslim majority is saying, we don't want to give religious freedom to the Christians and Jews. We don't want for them to profit in our, in our empire. We want all these things to go back to the way it was under Suleiman when we were super, super strong and really, really Muslim, right? Then a group of young patriots is going to seize power in, not, in the Ottoman Revolution of 1908, right? But highlight that right there. The Ottoman Revolution of 1908, a group of... Did I not put their name in here? Wow. I'm terrible at this today. But parentheses next to this, they're called the Young Turks, right? Now, the Young Turks is currently a very liberal uh, YouTube channel um, as well. They're a group of uh, YouTube um, news analysts, right? So it's actually kind of funny that way. If you ever want to look them up, they're actually kind of cool. They get a lot of really good cross-reference conversations going. Um, a group of young patriots is going to seize power. They're called the Young Turks. Now, they force the conservative sultan to implement several big reforms. Equality before the law, which means that everyone is judged equally before the law. Religious tolerance, open trade agreements, etc. Different things like that. Suffrage, ma more male suffrage. However, they were too late. Because the Balkans and other Western European countries had grown to hate the Ottoman due to their like overarching grab and their conservative models. They were, however, the Young Turks were instrumental in setting up the Turkey that you know today following World War I when the Ottoman would lose, okay? So, the biggest things about the decline of the Ottoman that you need to get out of that, the Tanzimat and the Young Turks, okay? So, or that you can say, like, uh, Western Europe loves a weak Ottoman, um, problems within, problems on the outside, whatever, whatever, nationalism is killing this empire. And that's it, and we're going to wrap it here, and then we're going to get into uh, some like labor reform i'm going to show you some gross face like gross picture of fossy jaw don't look it up yet it's really nasty all right anyway like so uh fossy jaw and some labor reforms and some marxian socialism on the move all right so and then we're gonna get into imperialism we're gonna keep that one kind of brief uh because it's just kind of like people try to fluff it up way too much um and then we're gonna get into world war one let's go all right so very good stuff hope you all are enjoying your break this is going to be the only flip between now and then um yeah so don't forget those two essays you got to get done, right? The LEQ and the DBQ. Y'all have a great evening.